Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about our scientific future with Dr. Michio Kaku. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford, episode 94, recorded on Tuesday, May 3rd, 2011. Physics of the Future. This episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about one business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com forward slash twit. Welcome, everyone, to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki. This is episode 94. And today, we have a very special guest with whom I will be speaking about our scientific future, more specifically, the physics of the future. And so I hope everyone is ready to dig into this show. You know, we have one hour with one expert on one topic. And that expert today that we're getting ready to get down and dirty with into the physics of the future is Dr. Michio Kaku. Dr. Kaku is a futurist, is from his Big Think blog uh, profile, popularizer of science and theoretical physicist, as well as a best-selling author and the host of two radio programs. He's almost as busy as I am, I think. He is the co-founder of the String Field Theory, which is a branch of string theory, and continues Einstein's search to unite the four fundamental forces of nature into one unified theory of everything. He holds the Henry Samat Chair and Professorship in Theoretical Physics and a joint appointment at City College of New York and the Graduate Center of SUNY. He's also a visiting professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and is a fellow of the American Physical Society. He's the, he's the author of several books, most, rec most recently, The Physics of the Future, which you can find on Amazon or any bookstore near you. And um, he is the host of, of what have been several Science Channel programs. Dr. Kaku, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Wow, glad to be on your program. Yeah. So let's get started with this idea of physics of the future. Your last book was The Physics of the Impossible. Well, which ended up pretty much being the improbable for a lot of the topics, more so than impossible. And now you've moved into the future. What was the what what was your rationale in moving from the impossible to our future? Well, in Physics of the Impossible, which was a New York Times bestseller, in fact, the first book ever on the New York Times bestseller list with the word physics in it, I went to thousands of years into the future when we have the possibility of time travel, warp drive, wormhole, dimensional gateways, looking glasses, all the stuff you see in science fiction, the Twilight Zone, and Stargate. However, what about our immediate future, like in the next 100 years? And so for those books, I interviewed over 300 of the world's top scientists for the Discovery Channel, BBC Television, Science Channel, and my own national radio show to get the most authentic, authoritative look at the coming decades by the scientists who are inventing the future in their laboratories. I'm not mm -hmm. a science fiction writer. I love science right. fiction, but hey, it's speculation. I'd like to get some real prototypes of the devices which are gonna change everything. And do you think that we have a lot of the prototypes available now? That, that are, are there things in laboratories that these 300 scientists are, have their hands, hands on on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. Let me just give you a trivial example. In the next 10, 15 years, the internet will be in your contact lens. So you will simply blink and you will go online. When you see somebody on the street, your contact lens will identify who that person is and print out a display in your contact lens right next to the image. 
And if they speak to you in Chinese, your contact lens will translate from Chinese into English even as they speak. And who are the first people to line up to buy these contact lenses? College students taking final <sighs> examinations. Oh, wow. They will blink and they will download all the amino acids, all the proteins, all the signs and codines, which you can look up on the internet anyway. The second people to download these internet contact lenses will be artists, architects. They will wave their hands in the air and beautiful sculptures, skyscrapers will emerge just by the motion of their fingers. And also who's gonna buy these things? Uh, tourists. When they see Rome, it's kind of a disappointment because the ruins of the Roman Empire are everywhere, but there's nothing left of the Roman Empire, really. In your contact lens, you will see the entire Roman Empire resurrected as it was 2,000 years ago. And also, this is big business. The military is putting millions of dollars to perfect these things. They want their soldiers to blink and see the entire battlefield on the Internet right in their contact lens. I had a chance mm. to take a film crew and go down to Fort Benning, Georgia to see a demonstration of this. I tell you, man, this is big. We're all going to really? be living in what is called augmented reality. Yeah. Yeah, I love the idea of augmented reality. Uh, last year, I had the chance to visit Rome, and my husband and I wandered around going, wouldn't it be neat if we had a pair of glasses or if we had an app on our phone that we could, you know, look at buildings and find out what was here you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, um, you know, and, and there really wasn't anything available. Contact lenses would have been even even better. Not that I, I'm a fan of contact lenses, but I probably would, would pop for a pair of those. And I can absolutely understand how important um, something that would augment the understanding that a soldier would have of what's happening on the battlefield would possibly be. Um, for what you saw at Fort Benning, what, how, how advanced is the technology that they're, they're working with for their augmented reality environment? Well, I had a demonstration. I put on a combat helmet and on the helmet there was a little eyepiece. You mm. flick it over and like in a quarter of a second, immediately in the eyepiece, you see the entire battlefield laid out. Enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery shells, aircraft, all of it laid out so that the fog of war will gradually be dissipated because every GI will know exactly how the battle is going and where the good guys are and where the bad guys are. Also, the Air Force is putting millions of dollars into this. If you're in a dogfight with a $10 million jet and the enemy goes underneath your airplane, you are dead meat. And there goes your $10 million airplane and you right. with it. In the future, you'll put cameras underneath the belly of your jet, shoot the image into your contact lens, so you'll have X-ray vision. You'll be able to receive right through your own feet to see the enemy underneath you. And it means that motorists will be able to have this. Uh, when you, In your contact lens, you'll see all the dials, gizmos, maps that you have on your cell phone or your GPS. But as you look around, your blind spots will disappear. There are going to be no blind spots because cameras in the back of the car will shoot the image right into your, into your contact lens. And you will always know who is behind your car. Car accidents are going to go down because, by the way, cars will drive themselves. Google right. is spending millions of dollars to protect driverless cars. I had a chance to drive one for BBC television. I went into this car. I flew my hands up in the air and I was driving a car like this. With my hands in the air. That's coming Look, within Mondo about hands. 10 years. Yeah, about, about 10, 10 years. years time. Yeah, we're going to have internet contact lenses and driverless cars. And then when you want to redecorate your house, wallpaper will be intelligent in the future. We physicists can make transistors made out of plastic now. They're called OLED, organic light emitting diodes. And it's flexible like paper. So when you put up your wallpaper in the future, you talk to it. They could change color, change pattern. Redecorating has never been so simple. And if you need a doctor, you'll simply talk to your wallpaper and bingo, an animated doctor will emerge who will answer with 90, 99% accuracy most of your simple health questions. RoboDoc will make house call any time of the day or night because you'll talk to it in your living room via your wallpaper. That's amazing. So. Do you think that the, I mean, it, it seems like it would be some kind of an answer tree that the robo doc would, would be basing its, its analysis on. So do you, 
you know, put your finger here or, you know, take your, take the temperature. What's your temperature? Okay. It's high or it's, or it's normal or it's low. And then that's how it works. From here, called, yeah. These are called expert system heuristics. Also robo lawyer is coming. You'll be able to talk <laughs> to the wall and a lawyer emerges that answers most of your everyday kinds of questions. And uh, when you want to do income tax or you want to have legal advice, you just talk to the wall and, and there it is. <laughs> And if the doctor wants to take an MRI scan of your body instead of going to the hospital, the world's smallest MRI machine today is the size of a laptop. In the future, the Germans who built this laptop MRI machine claim that it will be as small as your cell phone. So this is the tricorder of Star Trek. You simply wave this, Spock waves the tricorder right in front of your body, takes pictures of inside your body, and will detect cancer cells 10 years before a tumor forms. You realize that the word tumor could disappear from the English language? Every time you use a toilet, the toilet will have DNA chips in it, complements of Silicon Valley. They'll detect the presence of maybe 100 cancer cells in a cancer colony 10 years before you get breast cancer. So the word tumor could disappear from the English language every time you use the bathroom. So smart toilets, <laughs> hey. They could be the cure for a lot of health problems. Absolutely. I've often thought um, that it would be really useful to have a toilet that could analyze um, your urine to, or to be able to, as it's passing through, to be able to tell you, oh, you've got too much salt or you're, you're, you've got, um, you're getting rid of too many of these vitamins or minerals or whatever, and you should take X supplements as opposed to taking just random vitamin supplements that you think are going to help actually take specific ones because it's doing a, a urinalysis on you every time you go to the bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> and do a DNA scan of your body in the future. Uh, you mm -hmm. realize that Aretha Franklin is, is dying of pancreatic cancer. Steve Jobs of Apple Computer also mm -hmm. has pancreatic cancer. We used to think it was very aggressive killing you in three years or so. Now we realize that's not true. We've sequenced the genes of pancreatic cancer and we were shocked to find that all the mythology of pancreatic cancer was wrong. It's a slow growing cancer that takes 20 years before mm. it forms a tumor and kills you, but you only feel it. You only feel it in the last two to three years. So in the future, your toilet will tell you that you will have a tumor in your pancreas in 20 years, and you have 20 years time to get rid of it. And we will get rid of it using what are called nanoparticles, that is molecules that zero in on cancer cells and kill them individually like smart bombs. So we're mm. going to have smart bombs in the form of what are called nanomolecules that are specifically designed to home in on cancer cells. So we're going we're to witness a revolution in how we view cancer. I think that we'll see a revolution in how we see, how we view a, a number of different diseases, um, especially if we have this ability to be able to hone in on very particular parts of the body. Um, I, I can only imagine that these, uh, you know, the, the the nanobots or these smart bombs, as you call them, that they could, um, you know, help to take out uh, gallstones or, you know, kidney stones, you know, get rid of them before they start to form and, and cause you pain as you as you get older. Um, okay. And by the way, this is not science fiction. Nanoparticles already yeah. exist, and they've had 90% accuracy on some cancer tumors. And also, if certain organs are so diseased they have to be removed, then we'll simply grow replacement organs from your own cells. I had a chance to take a film mm. crew down to Wake Forest University, and it was like visiting Frankenstein's laboratory, because in these jars were all these human organs, living, beating human organs, grown from your own cells. So today, from your own cells, we can grow skin, bone, cartilage, noses, ears, heart valves, the first bladder was grown four years ago, the first mm -hmm. windpipe was grown last year, and the first liver will be grown in maybe the five years or so. So for you alcoholics out there, <laughs> take heart. We will grow new livers. Uh, unfortunately, Mickey Mantle, a great Yankee star, died of liver failure. We will cure liver failure in the future. In terms of the uh, the organ transplants or, or being able to grow our organs, um, what do you think or, or have, has anyone talked to you about what will be necessary to be able to 
um, supply blood and get the multiple cell types and more complex organ systems working together in a coordinated uh, well, way. The, the easy part is to create organs that do not involve that many blood vessels or nerves. Simple right. organs like the liver, the pancreas, and heart valves. Yeah. Uh, blood, for example, we've already isolated the stem cells of blood. So in principle, we can actually create gallons of your own blood from your own blood cells. We can create about two acres of skin from your own skin cells. But certain things are difficult to create. Kidneys are very difficult, lung tissue and brain tissue. However, even with regards to spinal cord injury, the human body shop is coming. Scientists have taken a rat where the, the hind two legs do not coordinate with the top two legs because the spinal cord was severed. They've been able to inject stem cells at the break and film it as a rat begins to walk on all four legs once again. This is almost hmm. biblical. It's like a scene from the Bible, seeing a rat that cannot access its pine two feet, all of a sudden using stem cells, begin to use all four feet again. Again, we don't know whether or not mice therapies will transfer to humans always. However, it's heartening to know that in certain limited cases, we can actually make progress against full spinal cord injuries. That and that would be such a such a promise and such a wonderful benefit to so many people who have lost the use of limbs for because of spinal cord injuries. I could just I, that that would just be a, a one of the holy grails of medicine. Right, and <laughs> it's a human body shop. We're talking about a yeah. human body shop, just like today you have a fender or a windshield broken, you just simply go to the body shop and order it. We're going to have a human body shop in the future. And not only that, we'll also be able to extend the human lifespan because scientists mm. now are unlocking the secret of the aging process. This is big. This is not quackery anymore. Throughout history, we've had a number of quacks and charlatans say they have the fountain of youth. We don't have the fountain of youth yet but we're beginning to crack the code of aging. We found about 60 genes which control the aging process in animals and in humans. And we can already double the lifespan of most animals from yeast cells, spiders, insects, rabbits, cats, dogs, all the way up to monkeys now. So this is big. Our grandkids may have the option of when they hit 30 years of age to simply stop aging at around 30 and cruise at 30 years of age for many a decade. This is something that was once thought to be science fiction and is now being seriously considered by scientists. I know some people are willing to uh, become, so become part of... Uh unofficial tests of these new life expansion technologies. Um, Ray Kurzweil being one, he's doing all sorts of uh, vitamin supplementation, calorie restriction, um, various methods to be able to live longer. Um, uh, but because of the human lifespan and how long it takes to actually find out if you have a number of people who are living longer because of these, uh, these, these medical um, changes or medical treatments, it, it just makes it very hard to test scientifically. Do you think that we'll ever get to a point that we are testing it scientifically or do you think that it's going to be pretty much a bunch of self-reported uh, data from individuals who are test using themselves as as rats, lab rats, lab mites? Well, right now, uh, because of the internet, uh, people get access to human growth hormones and they think that's the fountain of youth. Well, it's going to be very disappointing to a lot of people when they take all these pills and find out, hey, they're aging just like everybody else. What yeah. we're talking about, however, is real tangible results at the genetic level. Think mm -hmm. about it. We are 98.5 identical to the chimpanzee, genetically speaking, and yet we live twice as long. So among a handful of genes, a handful of genes are the genes which doubled our lifespan since the chimpanzees. And in the future, all of us will have a CD-ROM with all our genes on it, maybe even on our credit cards, and we'll take the genome of perhaps a million old people, contrast it with the genome of a million mm. young people, and subtract. And there we will find where aging is concentrated. You realize now that we think we know where aging is located, the physical location of aging. If I take a car 
And I ask, where is aging taking place in the car? It's in the engine. That's where you have moving parts. That's where you have oxidation, combustion, gummy carbon deposits build up. The engine is where aging takes place in a car. Where is the aging of a cell? It's the mitochondria. That's yeah. where oxidation takes place. So we even know where aging takes place. And if we have air correcting mechanisms, we may be able to begin to reverse the aging process because cells do that normally, but eventually even the cell repair mechanisms begin to break down. Now, let me emphasize something. We do not have the fountain of youth yet. All I'm saying is that we're laying the groundwork for it. And as I say, over the coming decades, our grandkids may have the option of actually playing with, their, with the human lifespan. I tell you, this can have enormous consequences. It does have enormous consequences. I, do, I, I just wonder how many people would be interested in expanding their lifespan um, if they didn't have the benefits of, uh, of medicine as well to decrease uh, illness and, and a lot of well, the, a, the actual medical problems that come with aging. Well, there's a famous story from Greek mythology. Eos was the goddess of the dawn who lived forever, but she fell in love with a mortal who, of course, eventually dies. So she went to Zeus to ask for the gift of immortality for her human lover. So Zeus felt sorry for Eos, so he gave the boyfriend the gift of immortality. But you see, the goddess made a huge, huge mistake. Mm. She forgot to ask for the gift of eternal youth. So her boyfriend got older and older and decrepit and deteriorated, but he could never die. He Ouch. could never die, <laughs> even if his bones fell apart and he got older and older. So we're going to have to find the secret of eternal youth also in addition to eternal life as, as we get more and more uh, developed into this field. Now, I should also point out that some people think that maybe we'll overpopulate the earth and the yeah. earth will be destroyed if we live so long. Actually, the demographics are in the opposite direction. The more developed a society is, the more wealthy it is, the, uh, instead of simply living longer and, and outproducing and using up all the food, the opposite happens. They have fewer children and the population begins to implode. Look at Japan. Japan just last year, for the first time in world history, the death rate and the birth rate reversed last year, causing quite a bit of identity shock in Japan as a consequence. And Germany, Austria, Switzerland, their birth rates are plunging down to about 1.2 children per family. And they too are suffering from an implosion rather than an explosion. And remember, if you're a peasant in the countryside, you do a calculus. Every kid you have makes you richer if you are a peasant. That's why peasants have 10 children. Mm -hmm. However, once they urbanize, they do the same calculus. Every kid makes you poorer because you have to feed them, clothe them, put them in college and high school, and, and rent is very expensive. As a consequence, peasants have two kids once they urbanize. And once they become middle class, they only have 1.2 children per family. So we're seeing the opposite of common sense. Yeah, as, but until until it, it there is kind of a a buffer a buffer area though until people have a have a less than one replacement. Um, don't um, we're we're still going to continue to see growth for a for a long period of time until we reach a a, a time that we can plateau or at least start going negative. And we're already looking at reaching what is it nine billion by the year. 2050 or even sooner than that? Right. Well, in the United States, our birth rate is about 2.2, which is just mm -hmm. above 2.1. 2.1 children per family is the placement level. So the yeah. United States is growing into the future. Uh, China's population, however, is going to be aging. They're going to be suffering from mm -hmm. an aging population because of their one kid policy. And right. so the Chinese population could begin to flatten out. And India could be the country with the largest population on Earth. By the way, in my book, Physics of Future, I also talk about the future of jobs. How will we feed all these people? How, what will they do in the future? The economy, the job market, all of them are changing very rapidly. And I had a chance to interview some of the great economists of the world to crystal ball mm. what jobs are doomed for extinction and what jobs will flourish into the future. And you'll Which be surprised. jobs will be, will be re replaced by robots? <laughs> Well, the jobs that are going to be replaced by robots depends upon what robots can do. And we've been brainwashed by Hollywood in 
to believe that robots can do, and it's totally wrong. I had a chance to interview all the leading lights in artificial intelligence theory, and I personally was a little bit shocked to find out the real reason why we don't have robots. We don't have robots today for two basic reasons. Forget Hollywood. Forget all the science fiction movies you've ever seen. The first is pattern recognition. That is the ability to recognize what you see. Robots can see 10 times better than you, except they don't understand what they see. They only, mm -hmm. they only see line, circles, squares, triangles, rectangles. They don't see they don't see chairs, people, boxes, dinner table. They don't recognize what they see. And yeah. that means that jobs that involve non-repetitive eyesight flourish into the future, like gardeners, construction workers, sanitation men, policemen. They will have jobs in the future because robots cannot recognize a crime. They cannot recognize garbage. They cannot build a construction site because they're all different. And the real surprise, however, is that the fundamental reason why we don't have robots is because of the common sense problem. We know that water is wet, not dry. We know that strings can pull, strings cannot push. We know that mothers are older than their daughters. And we know that when you die, you don't come back the next day. But you see, how do we know that? How do we know that sticks can push, sticks cannot pull? Because we've interacted with reality. Robots have not. There's no line of calculus that says that strings can pull, but strings cannot push. And people who try to codify the laws of common sense have all failed. There's simply yeah. too many that even a child understands. That's why robots are rather stupid. You know that the robot Watson that beat those two people on Jeopardy on national yeah. television, the yeah. media was saying, oh, it's only a matter of time before the robots put us in, in zoos. They, they throw peanuts at us and make <laughs> us dance behind bars. Wrong. <laughs> you know that Watson was so stupid that it didn't even know that it won? You couldn't congratulate Watson because right. it had absolutely no ability to do anything except win at Jeopardy. It was an adding machine. That's why you don't congratulate adding machines every time you do your income tax correctly, because it's an adding machine. And that's what <laughs> robots are. I'm just imagining people patting their little adding machine. Thank you, adding machine. Good job. Yeah. Congratulations. And, and <laughs> you added even well know. today. Yeah. And your adding machine is clueless about what just happened. Yeah. So we humans are, are, are going to be around for a while. However, then the question is, what happens when robots really do start to get intelligent? Maybe by the end of the century. Who knows for sure? Every time I interview people on this question, I get a different answer. But assume that by the end of this century, robots do become increasingly intelligent. Uh, I found that there are three groups of people in the field that I've interviewed. And I've interviewed all the leading lights in artificial intelligence there. One group of people say that we should let the robots take over. We should willingly die and let the robots succeed us because that's evolution, survival of the fittest. They are our children. And we should be proud to find that our children are taking over from us after we pass away from history. That's one group. Another group of scientists say, over my dead body, am I gonna let a robot take over? I'm gonna get a shotgun to blow their their gears right out of their brain, and I'm going to put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they get murderous thoughts. That's another mm -hmm. group that I interviewed. And a third group I interviewed said that we should merge with robots. What's wrong with waking up one day and finding out that we are immortal? We have the body of a Greek god. We have the power of a Superman. We're super handsome, super beautiful. Hey, what's wrong with that? There are perks being a god, you know. So some people say, why not use uh, biotechnology and artificial intelligence theory to enhance ourselves and become gods by the end of the century? So there's a wide spectrum of viewpoints on this question. There really are. I'm going to have to take a moment to take a break for a word for our sponsor. So if you'll just uh, stay, uh, just sit by, sit by for a moment, Dr. Kaku, and um, mm -hmm. I will go into our, to our, our thanks to our sponsor. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix delivers movies directly to your home, and that saves you time, money, and hassle. You never have to leave your house. 
what an advancement we have. You can instantly watch thousands of TV episodes and movies, have them stream directly to your PC or your Mac, or stream to your TV via a Netflix-ready de device that includes Xbox, Xbox 360s, PS3s, or Nintendo Wii's. I personally have a, a personal computer, a media center computer that I use to watch Netflix at home on my big screen TV. It makes for a wonderful movie night experience. You can also get DVDs by mail in about one business day if the, if, the, if the online movie watching just isn't for you quite yet. But you can watch as many movies as you want anytime you want, and there are never, ever any late fees or any due dates, which is great. I actually think I still have about three DVDs sitting on top of that Media Center computer that have to be sent back. Anyway, my Netflix streaming pick of the week for everyone watching this episode of The Science Hour. I think it fits perfectly in with the conversation that I was just having with Dr. Michio Kaku about robots and what our future is going to be. Doctor Who, you can watch the BBC's series Doctor Who, the remake of the of the original. Um, the series is fantastic. I've been watching it myself. You can find out about the Daleks. Who are the Daleks? The Daleks are kind of a, a, a organic robotic combination that have come to try and take over the universe. The Daleks with all of their emotion re removed to become the supreme beings. Is that the way that we're going to end up? Who knows? But you can watch Doctor Who and ponder thoughts like these as you enjoy the show. Uh, you can instantly watch that movie, watch the, watch the series. You go choose from thousands of TV episodes or even other movies that you might want to watch. When you register for a free trial membership. That's right, you can get a free trial membership and try it out and see if you like it. Go to Netflix, N-E-T-F-L-I-X.com forward slash twit, T-W-I-T. Be sure to sign up for your free trial at netflix.com forward slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And now back to the show. Dr. Kaku, um, are you familiar with the Doctor Who series yourself? I've, se I've seen some of them, and when I was a kid, I used to watch all the science <laughs> fiction, and I love going to the movies, even today. <laughs> well, in, in Doctor Who, the, the, you, you talked about this kind of in your Physics of the Impossible, which is the idea of time travel. Doctor, the Doctor is a time traveler, a time lord who's able to jump from one time to another in his special box. Um, but we were talking before the break about the idea of possibly merging our intelligence with that of, uh, of robots or computers, having a robotic body that's strong and powerful and doesn't age uh, with a human intelligence or even an augmented intelligence. Um, and they kind of cover that a little bit in with the Daleks and some other species that they come across in Doctor Who. And so it is something of science fiction. Um, do you think that the uh, the way that artificial intelligence and robotics are moving, that it, re that it will be something of, of our certain future? Well, if you saw the movie Circuit starring Bruce Willis, in the future that movie envisions that we would mentally control a counterpart who looks just like us, except we are enhanced. We're super beautiful, super handsome, super strong, we live forever, and eventually humans decide that they prefer to live through their surrogate super body rather than live through their decaying, decrepit, old, organic body. Well, the first step in that direction was taken by the Japanese. The Hunter Corporation has made the Asimo robot, one of the most advanced robots in the world, and they've mentally hooked it up to a worker. So a worker puts on a helmet which then picks up the radio emissions of the brain. A computer then deciphers the messages coming from the brain and shoots a message out to Asimo, a robot, who then carries out four basic functions, basically moving the shoulder and moving the head. That's today. And it's very unfortunate that that robot is not operational today because we need that robot to go into high radiation fields in Fukushima, Japan, mm -hmm where ro workers are being exposed to near lethal quantities of radiation. You're in these radiation fields for about one hour, and you already get uh, enough radiation 
to come down with radiation sickness, about 100 rads of radiation. And in just a few hours, they'll pick up about 500 rads of radiation, in which case people will begin to die because of radiation poisoning. So, so we don't have these robots ready today to go right into that high radiation field at Fukushima, but it tells you what's coming. And also, I predict that in the future, we will mentally control computers just by thinking about it. This, of course, is the power of the gods, but it's mm -hmm. a power that we will have. Already at Brown University, they've taken a stroke victim, put a chip in the person's brain, hooked the chip up to a laptop, and this person can now surf the web, answer emails, write emails, uh, do crossword puzzles, anything you can do online. This person can also do, it, and he's paralyzed. He's almost like a vegetable. So that's the future, mental control of intelligence, which normally is reserved for the gods. Hmm. We're talking about a lot of stuff that seems to be um, uh, m lots of sciences. It co covers a lot of the general sciences, biology, medicine, chemistry, um, yet the, the title of your book is physics, specifically of the future. Um, do, do you see all of these different sciences tying in with physics? Yes, I do. I see physics is the science that makes all of the above possible. Take a look at the deciphering of the DNA molecule. The DNA molecule was not deciphered by biologists. Back in the 1920s and 30s, most biologists were content giving names to owls and birds and moles. Physicists, on the other hand, like Erwin Schrodinger, said that it, there must be a molecule that encodes the secret of life. He didn't know what it was. We now know that it's DNA. But it was a quantum physicist who said there must be a molecule of life with a code on it. And then it was another physicist, Francis Crick, who teamed up with James Watson to actually prove that it was, in fact, the DNA molecule. And then it was yet another physicist, Walter Gilbert, who actually began the sequencing process to read the code of life. And so when we look at medicine, realize that in the future, medicine will be reduced to computer science. These are the words of David Baltimore, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. And physics makes it all possible. Physics makes possible the transistor, which makes possible the computer. Physics makes possible the laser, which makes possible communications, the internet. Physics makes possible the GPS system, which allows us to coordinate things on the planet Earth. So everywhere you see the inventions of the 20th century, you see a physicist at work. And now we physicists are inventing the 21st century. And that's why I call it physics of the future, because if you understand physics, you understand the outline of the future. Do you think that uh, that science is being taught uh, well? That it, I mean, do you think people understand that, have a grasp of this? You as a science communicator and educator yourself, as well as researcher, obviously understand the connections, the deep connections between physics and the rest of the sciences. Do you think there's anything that we can do to change the way that people perceive it? Well, yeah, I think that our educational system has really done a tremendous disservice. We have one of the worst educational systems known to science. Our school kids score near dead last among the developed nations in terms of science and math. And the only reason why our scientific community doesn't collapse totally is because of the H-1B visa. The United States <laughs> is like a gigantic magnet sucking in the best brains in a gigantic brain drain. And that keeps Silicon Valley. That keeps our scientific establishment going. But we can't rely on that forever because Indian Chinese scientists, they are now going back to India and China because those countries are now developed as, as developing as well. And so I think our scientific educational system in this country has to be completely turned upside down. You know, we're all born scientists. We're born wondering why the stars shine and where we come from. And around, around, 10, around the age of 10, we had this epiphany, this shock, realizing how big the universe is, much bigger than mommy and daddy and our, and our neighborhood kids. That shock is what keeps scientists going. That's the well that we draw from even many, many decades into, into our later life because the thrill of discovery was in that shock that we felt at around age 10.
Mm -hmm. And then around age 16, it's all over. It's <laughs> all over. Because hormones kick in, peer pressure kicks in, and high school crushes, high school crushes that flower of curiosity right out of you and yeah. replaces it with drudgery, memorization of stupid facts and figures. Many teachers say that our students are so stupid they flunk all the exams. Wrong. They are smart enough to realize that all the stuff they have to memorize is totally useless for their later life because they simply look it up on the internet mm -hmm. anyway. And that's why our educational system emphasizes facts, figures, dates, names, places, which internet contact lenses will eliminate totally. <laughs> And that I was just thinking science, that, yeah. That means that science professors like myself are going to have to stress concepts, principles that drive the entire field. For example, my daughter took the New York State Regents exam in geology, and I had a chance to go through the handbook. And I thought to myself, oh, this is going to be fun, talking about continental drift, talking about the recycle of rock, principles, concepts that are so simple to understand and have tremendous consequences. I opened up that geology book, and I felt like ripping it apart. <sighs> Just name, memorize the names of all the crystals. Memorize the names of all the minerals. Who cares? You look it up in a book. The concepts were buried, buried among this mass of memorization. And then my daughter comes up to me and, and she says, Daddy, why would anyone want to become a scientist? That was the most humiliating day of my life. I felt yeah. like ripping that book apart. And then I began to realize, hey, it's no accident that kids don't want to become scientists because not only are they ostracized from their peers by, by being called a nerd, but mm -hmm. then the field itself is deadly boring, learning stuff that you'll blink in the future and download off your contact lens anyway, but learning to think like a scientist, learning the thrill of discovery, the thrill of invention, that's not taught in high school. And that's a real shame. And in the future, when we compete with the Chinese, when we compete with the Indians, we compete with other countries, we're going to have to keep that in mind. That why don't we inspire our young people to go into the science? It's something to think about. Yeah. Do you think your books and your, uh, your TV shows are a step in that direction of the inspiration part of the path? Well, Maybe get people on the path to learning the more complex parts of concepts? I hope so. You know, when I was 10, that's when I decided to become a theoretical physicist. I read about the work of Einstein. I didn't know what he did. I just knew that it was really neat stuff, that he was on to this unified field theory that I couldn't understand. And I said to myself, yeah, I want to become a theoretical physicist. But whenever I went to the library, whenever I went to the bookstore, there was nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing that explained the unified field theory to me. Nothing mm -hmm. about antimatter, nothing about the fourth dimension, nothing about space warps. All that stuff I knew had to be there, but was missing. And I said to myself, when I grow up and I become a theoretical physicist, I want to make sure that if I ever write a book, I want to make sure that I write the book for someone like myself as a kid, being so frustrated that there wasn't anything out there that explained to me the cutting edge of science. And so that I keep that in mind. Whenever I write a book, I think about myself. I have a mental image of myself so frustrated that no one could explain all the stuff that I knew, I knew was out there. And now I get hundreds of emails from, from kids all over the world. And hopefully the books answer those questions that they also have that I had when I was a child. You've been uh, been called upon recently uh, to basically become uh, I, what I what I see as a as a, a science. Um, I, I guess it, you're you're a science spokesman in a certain a certain way for a lot of these news channels, news agencies. And after the Fukushima plant disaster, um, you you were called upon a lot to talk about what was going on in uh, the in the plants, what was happening with the uh, the nuclear meltdown process, the, the science behind it, kind of the 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 technical aspects of the engineering. Um, that has kind of faded away as we're further away from the earthquake and the tsunami and and, and it's not on the tip of our 
of our expectations when we turn on the the television these days. Are you still keeping an eye on what's happening there and uh, and and watching what they're doing with robots and and other things in order to be ready to communicate what's happening? Yes, definitely. Uh, in fact, the situation is still in the same way that a ticking time bomb is also stable in the sense that in a best case scenario, a best case scenario, if nothing goes wrong, in six to nine months, they finally may reach bottom. It's gonna be in free fall for another six to nine months until they can finally get the pumps working. The pumps are not working yet. We have firemen. These are samurai warriors, suicide warriors, going in knowing that many of them are never gonna make it out alive shooting hose water, hose water at three meltdowns at, at Fukushima. Yeah. And in six to nine months, we've hoped to get automatic pumps going so that we can relieve the firemen getting these enormous quantities of radiation. And the Hitachi Corporation even came out with a timetable. And the timetable says it'll take about 30 years. About 30 years, they finally clean up the uranium, clean it all up, and then seal it in concrete just like Chernobyl is sealed in a sarcophagus of concrete. So there's going to be 30 years of agonizing over this reactor accident in a best case scenario. In a worst case scenario, there could be another secondary earthquake. These earthquakes yeah. will persist for another year. And when that happens, they may have to evacuate these firemen. And once they evacuate all the people shooting hose water into the reactor, then the reactor accident is in free fall once again and remember, we caught that accident just in time by flushing the whole thing with seawater. That's unorthodox. So you're not going to find that in any nuclear engineering textbook. But right. they caught the reactor accident just in the nick of time as three reactors were melting down. It could start up again if there's another secondary earthquake or another pipe break and they have to evacuate the workers. That's how tenuous the situation is. And the, uh, the seawater basically took those those facilities and turned them into uh, just big pieces of concrete with that are radioactive, right? <laughs> they're they're yeah, not well, they're not Chernobyl, in working function anymore. Yeah, well, at Chernobyl, for example, Gorbachev called in the Red Air Force. Uh, he realized that the workers were overwhelmed. All the firemen could not put out the fire at Chernobyl. In fact, 30 of them died because of acute radiation poisoning. And so mm -hmm. he called in the Red Air Force and with helicopters and trucks, they sandbagged the whole thing, sealed it in concrete, boric acid, and sand, 5,000 tons worth of sand and concrete to bury the Chernobyl nuclear accident. And they may have to do something similar here once they remove the uranium. And that, in turn, will take about 10, 20 years before they can even begin the process of removing the damaged uranium. And by the I, way, this also has implications for the U.S. because, yeah. as you know, uh, President Barack Obama is planning a nuclear renaissance. And uh, America is also going to have to debate the so-called Faustian bargain. Faust with this mystical figure who sold his soul to the devil for unlimited power. And so the United States will also face this Faustian bargain as President Barack Obama contemplates our energy future for the next generation. How are you are you familiar with the thorium reactors that are um, that are not necessarily as um, as dangerous and don't have as much uh, as weight much waste as the current group of of fu of <clears throat> fusion reactors? Uh, right. However, I have a different spin on the whole question. Uh, first of all, solar power is twice as expensive as ordinary fossil fuels. However, solar power gets cheaper every year. And in about 10 years time, the curves, uh, fossil fuels rising in price and solar power decreasing in price, the two curves could cross in about 10 years time. And in 10 years time, the whole energy landscape will be uh, hostile to fission power because we may not need uranium because it takes about 10 years to begin the process of licensing and building and constructing a new power plant. It costs upwards of $5 billion to do so. And in 10 years time, the economic climate could be quite different than it is today with the falling price of solar. And so the different fission options may be simply uneconomical. 
And then right. in a 20 year time frame, fusion power starts right. to become an option. That's the power of the sun, which uses ordinary seawater as its fuel. The French and the European Union are bidding the store on fusion reactors. They're going to dump 10 billion euros on the ITER fusion reactor in southern France. And they hope to have it operational by 2020 and perhaps commercialized by 2030. So in other words, the fission option may simply be obsolete, too little, too late. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. The uh, the fusion reactor here outside of uh, outside of the Bay Area, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, the National uh, Inertial ignition Fusion Reactor, yeah, the National Ignition Facility, yes. the uh, they're they're looking at something very similar. Hopefully, we'll see them go into uh, go into full full uh, full light this year or maybe early next year, and actually. Uh, we'll see full fusion and then hopefully by 2020 actually see something um, much, much bigger. And so they're working, well, they're working similarly. Yeah, let's keep your fingers crossed. I actually took a film yeah. crew from the Discovery Channel to NIF. We actually filmed right at the chamber where they hope to get ignition. That is a piece of the sun on the earth sometime this year. And the director even told me that they hope to invite President Barack Obama uh, for the ceremony when they announced nice. David achieve break even. Now, I don't know whether they'll be successful or not. All I do know is that two groups, not one, but two groups, one in California and one in France are pushing yep. fusion power. And that may mean that fission power, the power of uranium or thorium, may simply be too little too late. Uh, it yep. may simply not be an option that Wall Street will be willing to invest in, given the fact it costs about $5 billion per reactor. And it takes about 10 years from the beginning of the licensing hearings to final completion. And solar and other alternatives look pretty attractive on that 10 year time frame. We're getting to the end of the show here and I would love to find out from you. We've been talking a lot about the physics of the future from your book, all of the different um, ideas that you've been putting forward. Um, would love to find out what your favorite physics of the future is going to be. Well, one of my favorite movies talking about the future is Forbidden Planet, where there was an alien civilization millions of years ahead of us that on one day they were going to unveil their greatest machine. It would allow them mentally to create any object, move any object, become, become a god basically just by the power of thought, a machine that would make it all possible. And on the very day they turned on the machine, they all died. A mystery. And at the very end of the movie, they finally revealed the answer as to why this super duper advanced civilization suddenly committed suicide the very day they turned on the greatest machine of all time, a machine that would make them into gods. It turned out that after they turned on the machine, it worked fine. All their thoughts became reality. They can conjure up anything they want by thinking about it. But then that night, they fell asleep. And when they fell asleep, they had nightmares, dreams. Mm. Every single dream came true. And these, this advanced civilization, the savagery of their ancient past came out and they committed suicide. So the moral of the story is, if we ever have the power of a God by having a machine that can carry out our wishes, let's not fall asleep. <laughs> so the, the invention that I think is going to change everything is going to be our ability to mentally control objects around us, to materialize objects from nothing, to move objects around, and we're going to have this capability. My attitude is we will have the power of a Greek god by year 2100. Now think about it for a moment. If our ancestors, our grandparents of 1900, who were dirt farmers, uh, if they could see us now, they would consider us to be wizards and sorcerers with our satellites and our laser beams and our GPS and the internet. If we were to see our grandkids of the year 2100, we would consider them to be gods. That is like Venus, we would have perfect bodies and timeless <laughs> bodies. Like Apollo, we would have chariots to ride through the sky in our flying cars. Uh, like Pegasus, we'd be able to create new life forms, uh, zoos of extinct animals, for example, well within our capability. And like Zeus, we would have the power 
of the mind being able to move objects, create objects. And so in the year 2100, I think we will have the power usually reserved for the gods of mythology. And that's what I think is going to be one of the great inventions in the year 2100, our ability to mentally control the world around us, materialize objects, move objects as if we were a god. And we just have to wait and see if these predictions will come true, if the science of today will lead into the predictions that Dr. Michio Kaku, you're making for the physics of the future. Thank you so much for joining me today on the Science Hour. It's been wonderful to speak with you and hear your, hear your ideas, your predictions. It's been just absolutely fabulous. Thank you. And anybody else out there who's watching or is in the chat room or... I don't know, wherever you are, if you're interested in more information about the physics of the future, you can find his, Dr. Michio Kaku's book on Amazon or at bookstores near you. Um, yeah, Amazon.com, just search for physics of the future. And if you are interested in more stuff, you don't, one book just won't do it for you, you can visit mkaku, K-A-K-U dot org. For more information about the good doctor himself and um, the things that he's up to, blog posts, uh, appearances, etc. So I hope that you will check that out. I'm Dr. Kiki and this has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Be sure to tune in next week. I'm going to be interviewing somebody interesting about a scientific subject that will just be fascinating. I assure you, I predict. That's my prediction for this week. You can find me online. I'm Dr. Kiki. Just Google D-R-K-I-K-I. -K -I. I'm available. I'm on Twitter, on Facebook, here on the Twit channel, and all sorts of other places. You can subscribe to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour in iTunes, and you can find past episodes at twit.tv forward slash Kiki. Thanks for tuning in to the Science Hour. All I ask is one, one hour a week, and I do hope that it made your week a lot more interesting. Thank you.